Well, good morning once again. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Um, as we kind of break away from our our series in the First Corinthians, um, I was asking the Lord what to preach on, and, and he had sent me to this passage, and I couldn't figure out for the longest time what it was supposed to be. And then I got to a phrase in verse 17, and I think probably all of us will understand this phrase. But in verse 17, it starts out saying, on one of those days. Come on now. And, and that really hit me, because I don't know about you, but I had one of those weeks. And I was reading this, and I'm like, well, that's interesting. Um, I wonder what he's talking about. And then he began to say, he says, on one of those days while he was teaching. I noticed in my Bible that the he was capitalized, which usually refers to uh, someone speaking about Jesus or God. And I said, whoa, Jesus had one of those days. Now, I know he had a really rough day one time. And he died. I know that. He had a rough couple days there for a while. I'm not talking about the really uh, tremendous uh, over, you know, the emergencies. I don't know about you, but I seem to handle the emergencies pretty well. Like if something really big happens, it's like, and I think most people, uh, from what I've seen over the years, most people in a really big emergency, we can just take a deep breath and we can gut it out, right? And we say, well, it's just an emergency. We can get through this. We can get through anything. But that's not what he's talking about here. And, and I think, very interesting, he was talking about one of those days where it's the everyday annoyances of life. It got real quiet. Y'all must have kids. Anyway, just kidding. Um, not really. Um, but you know those every days to where it's like, it seems like nothing goes right. And I find it interesting that those are the days that we have a hard time dealing with. You know, we can handle the big stuff, but man, when it comes to the everyday things, you know, how about a car breaking down the same day that you leave your lunch in the refrigerator at home, the same day that you get a call saying that your kid's sick and you got to try to figure out how to scramble because your car's broken down to get him. The only time you can really get him is lunch, which you don't have any of anyway. How many have had those days? Come on. So you have those days. And I, so I said, okay, Jesus is having one of those days. But, man, he, how, did, how could he? Wow, that really shocked me. Then I began to read what was going on before. And I'm just going to briefly tell you what was going on before because I don't think it was just a day. I think it was pretty several days. He uh, just gets back from a trip in the desert where he's been tempted. And he walks into a, a synagogue and he opens a scripture and he reads a very powerful passage from Isaiah and which turns the crowd against him, which causes them to want to throw him off a cliff, which then he just turns and walks through the crowd. So he's already been tried to be killed. Then he does some more healing, and he does some more preaching, and we read that he's trying to, he's doing all this healing, and he's trying to get away to a quiet place, but people kept following him, so he couldn't even get away. And, and, and he keeps going and going, and then the guy came up to him, had a skin disease, and God healed him. Jesus healed him from the skin disease and said, now don't tell anybody. And guess what happens? Everybody finds out about it. And so now he's finding himself and he's just completely, I mean, to me it sounds like no one's listening. No one's having respect for his own time and space. They tried to kill him. That's a pretty rough couple days. I mean, you know, I'm looking at going, I don't know if I've had that kind of bad day, but I mean, no one's tried to throw me off the cliff that I know of. And and I'm sitting there going, wow. I mean, he was really, he was really having these things. But in the middle of all this, one of the passages right before we get into it, the last verse in, in 5.16 said, Yet he often withdrew to a deserted pla place to pray. He was always getting alone, always trying to recharge, always trying to get with God, always trying to relax, always trying to get in because he was having these days. And so it comes into this next one. It says, On one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, and also from Jerusalem. 
Now, this is a story of the healing of the paralytic. If you've been to church as a kid, you've heard this story. This is a very popular story. If you're looking for coloring sheets, this is a good one to do because there's a hundred of them. And, and, and you look at this and, and you say, okay, well, it's whatever. This story is found in Mark 2 and it's also found in Matthew 9. And when you read these stories, they're in their three, it, this story's in there three different times. There's a little bit different spin to them. Some of them have greater detail than other, but it's the same story. And it's funny because in, in, in Mark 2, it says that all these people, this didn't, it didn't just specifically say the religious teachers, but all the people came to this town. The town was Capernaum, which was one of the, which is in Scripture in Matthew, it's called his town, because that's where he did most of his miracles. There's a, there's a triangle of three towns, and Capernaum makes one of the points. And in those trials, that's where he did most of his miracles, within these three, you know, about 15-mile radius is where he did most of his miracles. And as he's doing these things, in Capernaum we find out that all these people came in. It says that the, where he was teaching was so crowded that people were standing in the doorways and sitting in the windows, and they were just trying to get a, a glimpse of him. But I found it interesting that in Luke, he specifically says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Those who followed the Mosaic law. Um, those who um, tried to kill him just a little while ago. They were all there. They were trying to figure out what he was talking about, and he was, and they was jammed in there, and they couldn't get in anywhere. No one could get anywhere. The next passage, the next part of this verse says that they came from everywhere. Now, we probably don't believe that every town and village was represented. A lot of times we use the word every as in, like, saying a lot. Okay, And so all these people were there as far as Jerusalem, which was quite a ways away. And they were there because they heard about what Jesus had been doing. And it says in the next verse, in seven, or the next part of 17 says, And the Lord's power to heal was in him. So we look at this. It's one of those days. He's had some hard times, but he is getting away. He is seeing this. And he's got this calling to do some healing. And he's in this house, and people are jam-packed. And you think, well, hey, that's a good place to do healing. They're jam-packed in there. But it says, the next, that there are these men came carrying a man on a mat who was paralyzed. And they tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Verse 19 says, since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went on the roof. Now this is interesting to me. Because here is this, here is this awesome opportunity. God's got this calling to heal, and there was all these people in the house. And you would think that all those people in the house, there was someone in there that needed to be healed, right? Out of all those people funny thing is, is when I look at the miracles of Jesus, they always teach a lesson. He never just, I mean, even the ones where he's kind of all alone and he does something, it's for that individual, but it's really to tell, teach a lesson. It's like there is a reason why. And I'm wondering, the Bible doesn't record that any other healings took place except for this one that we're going to talk about. But here's this guy who desperately needs to be healed. I mean, we're talking, we're not talking you know, needs to be healed from a cold or, you know, a hurt foot or, or whatever. He is, I mean, this guy can't walk. He's been on a mat probably most of his life sitting at the city gate because that's where you sat because that's where you could beg and get money. And here's these guys, these, these four guys who knew that the guy's story and said, hey, Jesus is in town. I heard he did all this stuff. Maybe he can help this man. And they pick him up. I'm going to assume that these four guys, it doesn't say, but I think this guy, they knew him pretty well. And I don't know this for sure, but if this guy had been at the city gate for a long time, maybe these guys were a little younger that passed by him every day and saw his affliction every day and saw his hurt every day, that he couldn't move, he couldn't do anything, he was just there every day. So they had this idea, hey, let's grab this guy up and let's take him to Jesus because I've heard that Jesus can do these things. It's funny because if I kind of relate this to our lives, 
every day we walk by people who need some kind of healing. Whether it's physical healing, spiritual healing, healing in a relationship. We walk by people every day that need something. And when we walk by them, I wonder if we notice it. I wonder if we notice it. I mean, I wonder if we could say, you know what, I'm like that guy. I'm like those four. When I see, I mean, I know the answer, so I can give them the answer. I know what they need. Or do we just walk by and not even notice? The other players in the story are all those who are already in the house. And sometimes I wonder if we're like those people. We know the answer, and we're trying to learn, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we come, we come to church every Sunday, and we're trying to learn. We go to small group. We go to Bible studies and all this stuff, and we're trying to learn. We're trying to do these things. But every time when we're coming on here, we pass by people that need maybe to be carried because they just can't make it. But maybe we are so involved with ourselves and what we're trying to get out of this relationship that we don't miss it and we actually fill the place and we don't allow anybody else in. We won't let anybody pass who really needs us to act and do. I wonder. No, a, a story that it's very real. Talked to somebody and said, you know, we're not we're not gonna be coming to church anymore. Oh wow, what's going on? We're just not ready. What do you mean you're not ready? You're just not ready. That means something's going on and we have all walked walked past this person without noticing that they need to be picked up. Very interesting, isn't it? When we look at this story, we think it's a great miracle story. But you know what? I don't even think that's the main miracle. We haven't even got to the main miracle yet. So they're trying to get this guy in to see Jesus, and they can't. So they carry him up to the roof. Now, most of us, in, most of us uh, we would say, oh, they can't get in. Sorry, bud. We can't get in. We're just going to have to take you back to the city gate, or we're just going to have to leave you where we're at. We tried our best. We can sign off on the checklist that we did what we could, and now we're done. But these guys wouldn't take, I can't get in for an answer. These guys took, there's no room as, oh, there's always room. Man, isn't that true about the relationship with God? There is always room for one more. We could fill this building and there will always be room for one more. And, and so these guys said, you know what? That's not, no, we got to get them to Jesus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how inconvenient this is for me. Because now we got to carry a guy upstairs I wonder how many of us would do that anyway so they, they carry them upstairs well, once they get upstairs you got to understand the way their house was out back then they had this living area that most of the family lived in the house and then outside there was a staircase that went up to this flat roof and that was an extra living area because in the desert it gets pretty hot and everybody could sleep up there and they'd get a breeze but it's not like they had a door that went inside. And so they get up to the roof. And I'm wondering if one of the guys, because I would probably be that guy. Uh, all right, smarty pants, now what? We got him up here. I see no way to get downstairs. Great. We just carried this guy up the stairs, and there's nothing we can do. I would have probably been that guy. Because sometimes I have a tendency to see the things half empty. How many of us are in this building today? Half empty. I'm glad your wife is honest for you. You know, there, there, there's the other, there's those other one people that are like, oh, it's all going to work out great. You people drive us people crazy. <laughs> no, but we need to actually, I think in a lot of cases, those of us who are half empty, man, we need to, we need to see it on the other way. Because let me tell you something. I know that there's Jesus in the house. And it don't matter if there's no way to get down to him. Jesus is still there. 
and I know how to get it. And, and so this other guy of the, of the four, man, he probably had this great idea. He goes, hey, we don't own the house. Let's dig a hole. We don't got to live here. This must have been a youth group. I'm pretty sure, yeah, a service project, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys are like, let's dig a hole. Cool. I'm sure that's what happened. And, and so they start taking, you know, this, putting a hole in this people's roof. And I'm wondering if the people inside are going, what is going on? And it says it was right in front of Jesus, so Jesus had stuff falling on him. You know, I don't know if you're supposed to do that to the Messiah, let stuff fall on him. I don't know. That's got to be in the Mosaic Law somewhere. But they're digging a hole. Not only did they go out of their way to carry him to the house, not only did they went out of their way to carry him up the stairs, now they're going out of their way to dig a hole and lowering him to the only place where he could find healing was that at the feet of Jesus. And it says they lowered him in there. And when they lowered him in there, I, I wish I was there because I'd love to see the face of Jesus. Really. Because he's just trying to get out in the desert to be alone. <laughs> And he goes, man, they won't even let me be in a crowded house. <laughs> I don't think that's how it was because I think Jesus knew their heart. Because when it lowered there, it says in there, I'm going to read this to you because, man, this just blows my mind. In verse 20, seeing their faith. Seeing whose faith? The man on the mat? No. Seeing the friend's faith. Seeing the per those, those four guys. No, we don't know there's four guys. I'm just thinking of mat, four corners. Could be six. So don't, don't say I'm not preaching the truth. I'm just telling a story here, okay? So, so anyway, uh, you'd be surprised, Paul. You, <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so they drop him down in there, and he's seeing their faith, seeing the friend's faith. He said, friend, he looked at the guy on the, on the mat and said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And I think the, th the, the four guys who dig the hole said what about walking we just carried him up the stairs we just put a hole in the roof and you say his sins are forgiven and it's so funny because the leaders the church the religious the ones that wouldn't let this guy in the one that thought they were more important than the person who really needed Jesus you know they blocked the doors and the windows and all those things so that no one could get in and they wouldn't pass It says in their hearts, they begin to think, who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? And in their hearts, it doesn't say that they said this out loud. It said this, that this was in their hearts. Okay, yeah, they just tried to throw him off a cliff. This guy's not very popular. And now he's saying your sins are forgiven, which according to the law, only God can do that, right? See, they missed the fact that who was sitting in front of them was Messiah Jesus. They missed the fact that this was the promised one. They missed the fact that this one was coming to set it all right. Sometimes us religious folks forget the fact that it's Jesus that sets it right, not our church, not our programs, not us. It is Jesus alone. So Jesus said, it says in the next part, that Jesus saw or perceived, looked into their heart. Oh, how many times have Jesus done that to us? Looked straight in the heart, and, and, and really, in all honesty, what this man needed wasn't to be what he, what he really needed was the sins forgiven. That was the truth. And I don't know where you're at in your life, but I know that you may be going having one of those days, weeks, years, 10 years, whatever, you may be having a hard time and you think that this thing would help you out or this raise would help you out or this new house would help you out. And you've been praying that God get, me this, get us into this and get us into that. And God, and you say, he's not answering my prayer. Maybe he's not answering your prayer the way you want it because he's giving you what you need. This man needed his sins forgiven over walking. 
But he said it perceived in their religious hearts because these guys were like already, they were making a list and checking it twice. Because they, they were trying to get Jesus from the beginning. So they were looking at it every, every aspect of this. And Jesus saw it and he said, hey, why are you thinking what you're thinking? Is it easier for me to say your friends are forgiven or to get up and walk? He says, so that you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, I say, and he looks at the man on the mat and says, get up and walk. I don't believe we even found, we're not even close to the miracle yet. You see, so the guy gets up and walks. He says he got up, he rolled up his mat, which I don't even know if I'd have rolled up my mat. <laughs> if I'm walking, I'm going to be like my kids. I'll just leave it over there. Someone else will get it. I can walk. The guy rolled up his mat, turned around, and he walked out the door that was previously blocked. Why was that? Why was it okay, religious people, in this story, for you not to let the guy in, but you let him out? Because maybe the reflection of what they were seeing, they did not like. Maybe because they saw something that took place in this man's life, and they said, why didn't we think of that? And they saw a reflection of themselves. And they thought, man. And I guarantee you, we're going to come back to that mirror in a little bit. I guarantee you that when that man walked out, there was jaws on the floor, eyes wide, amazed at what they saw. Matter of fact, it says in one passage that we had seen later on, we have seen some miraculous things today. You think? Sins were forgiven. Awesome miracle. Every one of us should understand that. Got up and walk. Amazing. Jesus gave what the man needed first and then gave him what he really wanted and what those four guys wanted. But guess what? That's not the end of the story. Because Jesus was teaching a lesson here. He was teaching the fact that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. He was teaching the fact he was telling them. Because according to the law, only the Messiah, only God could do that. He was saying, yeah, I have that authority. Because uh, in, uh, John, in John, he says that the Father, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that that. He is in the Father and that the Father is in Him. I mean, He was saying, we are one. We are on the same mission. We're doing the same things. And He was trying to teach this lesson. It says, after this, Jesus went out. Now, I don't know if it was a day or whatever. I tend to read it that He got fed up and He saw the open door and He went out behind the guy. Why? Because the faith of His friends is what caused that miracle to take place. It's because someone had, had faith in somebody else. Now, I know that I can't wish someone's salvation. But you know what? I can pray for somebody, and I could give my, and I could be on my knees for somebody, and I could want, and I could have faith that someday something's going to take place where that individual will realize that Jesus Messiah is real and that their sins can be forgiven. I can pray that there will be a, re a receiving of this awesome gift of relationship with Jesus. I can pray that. And I believe with everything in me that Jesus will make it happen because of my faith. I want you to know when I received the Lord, uh, when I, when I uh, rededicated my life to the Lord, I don't believe it was on my faith because I was scared to death. But I believe it was on the faith of my grandparents who prayed for me every day. 
I believe it was on the, on the faith of my youth pastor that prayed for me every day and my senior pastor that prayed for me every day and my mom and dad that prayed for me every day. I think it was because of my in-laws who I didn't even know yet were praying for me every day. It's because of those prayers. And I believe that those people in my life didn't pass me by. Those people in my life saw that what I needed and they began to say, you know what, I can't give that to you, but I know who can and I have the answer. It was like those people picked up my life on a mat and carried me to Jesus because circumstances took place that caused me to stop and fall on my face before God. It was those kind of people. And I think Jesus was disgusted with the religious who only wanted to argue about the law, was only there to try to trap Jesus. I think, I think Jesus was disgusted, and I think he walked out of that house right behind the paralytic, said, I'm done. He says he walked out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a table. You say, so what? Do you like the IRS guy? Neither did they. <laughs> Matter of fact, you want a hated person, it was a tax collector. Most tax collectors were crooked. Shocker. And they were taking money off the top for themselves. They were saying, hey, Herod needs his portion, Caesar needs his portion, and if you want to make sure that those two portions get to where they're going, I need my portion. So Jesus went out of the house, and he sees this guy sitting at the table. If it were me and I'm mad, I'm probably flipping his table over. But no. It says, he went out, saw the tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, you, follow me. Here's the miracle, folks. I mean, there's lots of miracles going on here, but this is the one I think is like the icing on the cake in the story. It says that Levi, so leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow Jesus. He didn't lock the door of the tax office. He didn't scoop the money in the drawer and shut it. He got up after Jesus said, follow me. Why do I think this is important? Because he didn't look at those who were trying to trap him and say, follow me. He found a guy who needed something, who needed his sins forgiven. He found somebody that needed Jesus desperately. Because see, us religious folks, we have a hard time sometimes actually needing Jesus because we got our rules. That, that helps. He went to a guy that said, hey, you need me, come follow me. And the guy goes, I do. Because when we get down to it, we all know what, we, what ourselves look like inside now, don't we? We all know what we need. We all know what we desperately need, need inside. And so he sits there and he says, okay, he follows him, he leaves everything behind. You know what? We would have a hard time doing that in today's culture. If Jesus said, really, follow me, we would need the GPS coordinates of where we were going to make sure that Jesus didn't get lost on his way. I mean, we would want to make sure, Jesus, did you map quest this? Because you got to be right. Well, if he's using map quest, it's not going to be right. Everything that's going on here points to this, this guy, and he gets up and he follows him. Then it says the next that the Levi, he hosted a grand banquet for him. Well, of course this guy could host a grand banquet for him because he had everybody else's money. So he hosts this big banquet. Guess who's there? Those religious folks that wouldn't let the paralytic in? They're there too. He's hosting this big banquet because... I believe that he understood that this guy, that Jesus was the real deal. And he understood, and I think he followed Jesus. And I don't mean that means Jesus followed him down the street. I mean, believe that when the Bible says, and he followed Jesus, it was a sold out, I'm following him wherever he leads. So he throws this party. 
And these same guys that wouldn't allow that guy to get healed because they wouldn't let him in, looks at Jesus and said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see, these guys hadn't learned the lesson the first time, so Jesus has to do it again. And he says to them, straight out, he goes, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus, <laughs> he looks at them and goes, you guys are the sick ones. <laughs> or you, don't, you, you, guys, you guys think you're not the sick ones. You guys think that you don't need me. Why would I come for that? But I came for those who are sick. Those who are desperate, needing something from me. They need their sins forgiven. They need their life. They need to see something different in their life. But you guys don't. It goes on the rest of five and talks that they question him about fasting and they question him about all this. They're just trying to deal with the law. They haven't figured out what Jesus was trying to teach them, that Jesus was there to set them free from their religious bondage. They were, Jesus came to set them free from their bondage of sin because we are all sinners. The Bible says we have all fallen short. The word sin, I know a lot of people get, they get real angry about it because it's been thrown at people's face. Man, it's an archery word, word that means you missed the mark. You didn't hit the target. That's what it means. And every single one of us in this room have had times where we've missed the mark. Come on. But Jesus came to put that arrow back in the center. He came that all the sin, all the stuff where we've missed, Jesus said, I came so that you are not have to pay for that anymore. I have come to set you from your sin, free from your sin. I have come to set you. And he was trying to tell the religious leaders, you are so religious, you are in bondage. Maybe you're doing the right things, but your heart is hard and cold. And you're doing it out of obligation and not out of love. And you are in bondage. Matter of fact, at one point, Jesus looks at the re religious and says, man, you are making people twice twice the sons of hell. That's some pretty strong language. I mean, he was saying, don't you want to get set free? Don't, don't, don't we want to get set free? You see, because the reflection is, and you guys may not be able to see it. Can you see that? You see, I don't want to see myself in the reflection. I want to see the cross. Because if I see myself, it's messed up. If I see myself, then I know that I'm not letting the people who really need Jesus in. That I'm getting in the way, that I'm, getting, that I'm, that I'm burdening them. What I need, what I need is to see the reflection. And, you know, maybe I see my face, but the thing I want to see is the cross. There's a lot of things on this reflection that distort. There's all these dust particles in our lives that distort. But when Jesus, when we get a hold of Jesus, man, he wipes it clean. And I don't know where you're at in your life, but maybe you've got something in your life that you feel has just been, you're having one of those days. Well, I want you to know today there's a gospel truth, the good news truth, is that Jesus had those days, and he came and set us free anyway. And you know what? He's got something specifically planned for you. Where's your commitment? You know, we talked about all these things. I just want to talk to, to those of you who, who are in the body of Christ. Listen to me. We talk about all the terrible tragedies that are coming, that are going on with persecution and everything. But God has really put on my heart to begin to pray something different. Yeah, I want to pray that they are relieved from persecution, right? That somehow something happens where that persecution doesn't exist. But I have begun to praying something lately this week, and it was really hard to do it. But I've been thanking God for every one of those who put their life down because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. Because they weren't afraid. 
They weren't afraid to let one of those days get in the way of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah and he is here to set us free. And I guarantee you that those martyrs weren't there praying for themselves. They were praying for those who were taking their lives because that is the spirit of martyrdom. Where are we? Do we have that kind of commitment? Or are we the type of followers of Jesus who block the doors and windows for people who really need to hear the gospel message? Now, for those of you who maybe you're not, you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe you've never accepted this gift, and, and I don't know where you are, maybe you've, you have and you've struggled, let me tell you something. You may feel like you're on a mat and paralyzed, but today is the day that Jesus tells you, pick up your mat and walk. Because my God is still the God of miracles. You may be one of those that says, my reflection's kind of dusty and I need Jesus to come and dust it off. Today is that day. You know, I don't believe we have to look any farther than right now to know that we have a Savior named Jesus. Jesus. It seems lately that our message here has been, and I'm going to speak in social language so everybody understands, hashtag do something. Our youth group kind of got a new slogan. It's that, hashtag do something. I've been preaching about up here. We, We just sang a song this morning that said do something. You know, that's for both, that's for all of us. I'm getting ready to close, Brian. You all can come on up. That's for all of us. You see, some of us need to get out and do some ministry. Some of us need to go out and pick up some people on a mat. Some of us need to do that. Some of us need to get out of the way so people can get in. Some of us, and what I mean that is, is let's set our ego aside and our pride aside and our religious um, bigotry aside and let someone in who needs Jesus. Some of us need to do that. Some of us in the room need to get up and walk and there's nothing special about that here at the Lighthouse Church all of our okay I thought that was mine going anyway some of us I didn't know where I went (laughs) I got sidetracked beach ball moment it's all right that was my fault I I went there I followed the beach ball hey ADD preachers are not good Our altars are always open here at the lighthouse. And this is, not, this is not a special place. It's pieces of wood put together in front of a platform. Your chair can be an altar. Your living room can be an altar. Your car on the way home can be an altar. The fact is that some of us need to get up and say, Jesus, I need to walk because I've been paralyzed for way too long. You may be in the church and you may be saved. You may be know that you're going to heaven one day. But let me tell you something. If you've been paralyzed because you won't get involved, you won't do something, you need to get up and walk. If you don't know Jesus, you need to get up and walk because you're living in bondage. You're living in sin. But the good news is that the cross of Christ is big enough for all of our sin put together. Jesus took the sin of the world on him. He said it is finished. He said it's done. He has wiped the slate clean. He has rebuilt our temple to the glory of God and God alone. There's no excuses. This world is throwing stuff at us left and right that don't make any sense. There is hatred and violence on every corner of the planet. Jesus came to stand up in the middle of it all and say, peace be still. But he can only do that because he's only ever worked through his people. It is my prayer that you will stand and walk and do something today. Whether it's ministry of some kind. I'm not talking about a church program. I'm talking about going to your neighbor and finding out what they want. I'm talking about going into your house and finding out what they, they need in your home. Ministry is not a church thing. Ministry is a life thing. And we are all called to it.
Get up and do something. Stand with us. We're going to sing together. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. 
you know, something was taking place during the service. There was this fringe of people wanting to get excited, wanting to clap. Paul and I talked about it last week. There was kind of a heaviness, right? And sometimes I wonder if we get so comfortable in here that we forget that, that the spirit of the God, the living God is with us. In the Old Testament, something took place. Children, were, children of Israel were supposed to be into the promised land. And for us, our promised land, it's not heaven, folks. Our promised land is anywhere that the Spirit of the Lord is. He is here. And you know what they did? They shouted to God. And it said that wall came down. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Let's lift him up high. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing that. Let's sing that again. Hallelujah. Don't stop. Come on, keep it going. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. Come on, church. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is... One more time. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. Father God, we give you all the praise and glory for the victories taking place today. We claim the victory that the walls are tumbling down and we stand in freedom in Jesus Christ. Let us go out as lighthouses into our nation, into our communities. Let us do ministry every day as a lifestyle. May God go with you. May his face shine upon you. May his favor rest upon you. May you be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the name of Jesus.